I'm a huge fan of Roger's last book. Um, I have it here with me. And I thought maybe to get us started that I would read a piece of this to give you a sense, those of you who have not read it, uh, of the wonderful, I hate the word exuberance, but these, uh, there's an exuberance in the language, an embracing, optimistic sense of the world uh, that reminds me of certain jazz musicians. Uh, one thing leads to another in some way that's not logical but could not possibly be done any other way uh, except the way Roger's done it. So I'm going to just read the one section, and uh, maybe we can tempt him into reading some of his own uh, after that. So again, this is from The Boy Detective, one of the best books about New York and cities in general that I know of. Who could tire of New York? Dr. Johnson said that anyone who tires of London tires of life. London? Was he kidding? The roses in the window of an old bar and grill. The stick marks on the sidewalk made when the cement was still wet. The courage of small birds. The courage of people coming from work going to work. Sometimes when I drive to in from Long Island before teaching, I pull off to the side, stop, and watch. I close the car windows and put on a CD of John Lewis of the Modern Jazz Quartet, playing a souped-up version of Bach. Or I play the Rock Three, R-A-C-H. Uh, the Rock Three, so that my fellow citizens may go about their errands to the accompaniment of Rachmaninoff. The Rock Three moves as they move, alternately melancholy, sprightly, sweet, bittersweet, aggressive, bombastic, sad, and exultant. How brave are these people? Rachmaninoff weeps without tears. I love that paragraph. I wish I'd written it. <laughs> <laughs> you probably did, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about great books about New York. Um, the uh, I'm delighted and flattered, and I love the fact that Pete loved it. But you're getting love from the guy who wrote uh, Forever in Downtown, and if you haven't read those books, you're in for a treat. I'm not suggesting you buy them instead of my book, but I am <laughs> suggesting <that. laughs> those are books, boy. We could put a package deal together. <laughs> <laughs> That's a thought. <laughs> a twofer, as they say on Broadway. Um, just that, that particular paragraph and the tone through a lot of the book, Roger, um, you're sitting down, you're at a table somewhere, the door is closed to keep out uh, reality or the kids or the neighbors or whatever. What comes first? A single word, a, a kind of a tune, a melody, what is it? It's a, it's a wonderful question. Um, I, first of all, I was thinking the kids they, that the door keeps out, which is rare, we live with our grandchildren, as you know, or a lot, a lot of the time with them now. We used to live full time with them uh, since our daughter died. And the, the, the uh, uh, our our granddaughter introduced me to our fourth to her fourth grade classmates. Thus, uh, this is Bapo, my grandparental name. This is Bapo. He lives in the basement and does nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the one I want out. <laughs> Um, Did you get a new ID card? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, I th one of the, uh, one of several reasons I was um, 
lucky and grateful to have an intelligence and a, and a sympathetic mind like Pete to review this book for the New York Times was that um, he saw something in it that I never expected anybody, um, anybody to see or hear, as it were. Uh, writers don't, t at least smart ones, don't talk about their own stuff. They don't suggest how they want you to read it. Uh, it's not only self-aggrandizing, it's, um, it's probably superstitiously bad luck. You just don't do that. But you do hope in some quiet recess of your mind that your book will reach someone who actually catches what you th are throwing, uh, even though there's never such a guarantee. And when he compared me to Sonny Rollins in this review, um, I figured, you know, go ahead, car, hit me. It's over. I don't need anything more. <laughs> uh, um, because I do hear a music in the prose. Uh, at a different passage in the book, I create a conversation between a, a cop and me as I was brought down to the station to answer questions. I'm, I'm constantly playing with those games in the book. And the cop says, well, how do you write? I say, by, I, I write by ear. And I do. I play piano by ear, and I write by ear. I hear the, the rhythms of it. Then the words start to come, the music, then the lyrics. Um, and um, the, uh, the feeling then is since I write in these short sections, as you know, the one following the other, that if there's something wrong with the order, it's something's wrong with the music, I'll just shift the section, uh -huh. move it around again. Th uh, that's interesting, because in my case, um, when I first started working for the New York Post in 1960, I think uh, Calvin Coolidge was president? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I believe so. Um, he never said. <laughs> Uh, I was a huge fan of jazz, and Sonny Rollins famously would go up on the bridge, uh, the Williamsburg Bridge, and play to the bridge, not to an audience, not to paid customers, not to anybody, but playing because he loved it. And I remembered when I first started at the paper, um, reading an interview with the drummer Gene Krupa, who was the drummer for Benny Goodman's band at one point, and he was asked, "You're keeping, if you're keeping time for the band, what do you keep time to? And he said that he had this little chant that he would have what he was playing on the drums. And it went, lionese potatoes and some pork chops. Boom, lionese potatoes and some pork chops. Lionese potatoes. So there I was writing uh, stories about murders at 2 o'clock in the morning at the New York Post down on 75 West Street. And I'd be, lionese potatoes <laughs> and some pork Mainly because I wanted to get rhythm into the into the language that it didn't it what didn't flatten out it wasn't police today were hunting for the killer of a thirty two year old wife it wasn't that um, or it wasn't two dead three hurt in a car crash it was you know something happening on the street of the city that I was a partial witness to the aftermath as a reporter and trying to get the sense of that, the sense of place, uh, and the rhythm that should accompany uh, something as grave as a murder, without saying, as too often now happens, uh, this was a tragedy. Right. You, you don't want to say that. You want the reader to say that, That's but right. you never say it. Just as in acting, you don't cry because you want the audience to cry. Exactly. Um, there's something to this. I haven't thought of it before, but those of us who hear the music, um, as Pete and I are describing, are not just, it's not just a technical thing. Jazz is the democratic instrument. Jazz is the democratic mu uh, uh, music. A guy standing on a bridge playing is playing because he believes in the world. He believes that uh, everybody has the same rights in the world. He, there are no discriminations between poor and rich, those who have and have not. It's all in the music. 
Pamela and I believe this. Um, we discovered in our work, uh, which is uh, very nice, and we appeal to people who have like beliefs. The um, in downtown, he correct me if I'm wrong, but it's been a while since I've read it. You talk about nostalgia being a main emotion or feeling about New York, but also it accompanies a feeling of loss. Yes. And that is something so that you really lost and and valued and yes. lost. Yes. Um, and that f that perception, uh, it's so beautiful and so true, and then gives you this kind of melancholy feeling that goes with the music, so that the minor chords come in, um, even in a happy song, and uh, and then you start to play. You play what you feel. Uh, and uh, what you feel is almost entirely democratic. It's all, it, has to, it has to do with the worth of everybody, the value of everybody, the smallest and the poorest and the, um, the one with the least in the world, maybe the one with the least in the world who draws our attention more than anyone else, just because nobody else is looking. But it's that music. Yes. And uh, the interesting thing, I think, is very similar in our careers, even though th it, they, they took place in different places. Um, we didn't work for anybody who wanted to make the reader dumber. <laughs> and these days, there's a lot of guys. For example, uh, there's three newspapers in New York. Two of them are edited by Brits, uh, who might not know the weight of an address example, any more than I would if I were writing about Manchester. I wouldn't know what the address meant. Mm. What did it, what was it a sliver of? What, what was the world that it came from? Um, and they assume that the, the punters, as they call them, uh, want bikini babes and uh, st in, in the middle of January with the blizzard blowing. Um, on page three, that somehow <laughs> that will sell newspapers, and yet, you know, hundreds of women give up on the paper each time they do that, uh, which is fatal to the history of newspapers because our newspapers depend on advertising. Men do not buy toasters uh, at Macy's. They don't really even buy the women in bikinis. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so we were lucky to have editors who wanted to make the work better, to be able to say that can be tighter, that can be sharper. Your leads in the third paragraph, move it around a little more. Um, to have those kind of professional craftsmen and craftswomen uh, was one of the great good strokes of it's fortune I it's ever gift. had. It, me too. It's a gift. And um, no editor says this. It's like, you know, you, 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 those editors want to be tough and the people who work for them want to be tough and there's kind of an ethos that goes with the deal. But the best editors have an imagination. They imagine the world better. They don't say it to you, but they imagine the world um, uh, to be fairer, cleaner, safer, kinder. That's I never thought of that. You're right. But they do. And so the assignments they give you and the things they appreciate that you write all reflect this. I, was, um, I, I just got a call to speak at a memorial service for a great woman, Pat Ryan, who um, I don't know if you knew her. She edited, first editor of People, first woman editor of People. A terrific, terrific woman. Um, and a, ter a terrific editor. She was smart and clever and all the things that you want in an editor. But the thing that nobody would say of her is that she imagined the world better. Mm -hmm. So even People, which was you know a celebrity magazine when it started, under her had major issues uh, uh, interspersed among the star stories, and that's how she uh, she made her mark in the world, as you know, as did her husband Ray Cave, the fellow I mentioned before. But it's true. It's the the first of all, every good writer wants an e a very good editor. You yes, really, you really do want that. I <laughs> my wife is my editor now. And the uh, <laughs> a couple of year, years ago, I put out a collection of stuff um, 
uh, that I had written uh, uh, for Time, and I dedicated it to Ginny, my most exacting editor. But the copy editor at Random House didn't know the word exacting, so he put <laughs> most exciting editor. <laughs> <laughs> so Ginny was getting these calls from every writer in the country. <laughs> I knew a couple of exacting copy editors. <laughs> <laughs> did you, did you, I'm sorry, this is all shop talk, but the, at Newsweek there was, a <laughs> um, there was a story that included a sentence uh, about Bennett College, a finishing school. Uh, I don't know if it still exists, but basically a finishing school, Bennett College, and w uh, preceded it with the adjective to indicate that it was high class. So the sentence read, Tony Bennett, Bennett College, <laughs> <laughs> which, which the copy editor corrected because you know, didn't want Tony. So it became Tony Bennett University. <laughs> because of you, you could do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. He left his heart in Tony Bennett College. But it, it, one of the things about newspapers and now particularly, and magazines, um, because magazines are as hard to find on newsstands as newspapers are now. I sometimes have to go to seven or eight places to get a Wall Street Journal on a Saturday. You know, they just don't carry them or don't deliver them or whatever. Um, but one of the things that, that uh, is being lost, and it hurts us who, who practice the craft as much as it hurts the readers is we're losing the craftsmen. We're losing the people who uh, say, don't you ever use the word decimate again unless you mean to reduce it by 10%. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> that kind of cr craftsman who has actually looked the word up. Um, and I think... that. It, Journalism is going to survive because we, the country needs it. You have to have it. It's going to not survive the way it was 20 years ago. Um, it's already changed. Uh, but we're going to lose the craft if we're not careful. And I think people have to be much more conscious, bring in some of the great tough craftsmen to educate a new generation, uh, to pass on what they know about language, about veracity, about checking sources, about all the, the things that go with the craft that's essential to this country. Um, I don't think that's happening yet, but I think inevitably we're getting to a point where we're going to need to do it. It's not an accident that Pete and I and um, lots of others, actually, who um, honed our craft in journalism are writing books now. Pete has written a lot of books in recent years, and so have I. And one main reason, apart from the fact that we hear Time's Winged Chariot and want to get much as much as we can to uh, done before our time, is that we control the books. Yeah. The, um, we hope we've learned enough to be able to satisfactorily um, please our readers. And um, while it would be very nice to have the kinds of editors Pete is talking about, they don't exist really. Even in books, they don't exist. Um, I have one. I'm sure Pete has one. There might be a half a dozen others. I'm talking about in the whole country. The rest are acquirers, which is another matter entirely. Yeah. Uh, somebody is... In, is or packages. Or packages. Um, but uh, Frank, it, it's, it turned out to be a bit of luck. Uh, it's certainly luck for Pete and me, and it, we hope it's lucky for you, um, that we do write books now a lot uh, because it is, and we've also learned to write quickly um, so that we hope we write as well as we can, as fast as we can, to see what inspiration then brings out the stories that we regard as important to tell. We both, um, the, in The Boy Detective, um, 
I started out with doing this in kayak morning, which was when I just went out in my kayak and started to think about my daughter. Uh, and then I continued it in The Boy Detective, continued it in the book about love that's coming out next January. I've changed the, f the form to correspond to what Pete perceived, to this musical movements, jazz movements, so that I have no chapters as demarcations. I just have sections of a book, one following another, connected by enough tissue so that I hope the reader is willing to go along for the ride. Not everybody will be, but... Um, you hope that most of the readers are willing to go along for the ride, stay till the end of the song. And um, uh, I never would have done this if I hadn't been encouraged uh, to, pra to practice the art of writing a book and another book and another book until I begin to see this is the song I was meant to play. This is the tune I was meant to write. It, you know, it doesn't happen all at once. Do you think... Um Teaching helped you to focus better on what you were doing. I'm not sure. I um, now. I mean, I only really. I've been teaching since I was 22, and I've learned to do it in the last 10 years. You know, and I'm not joking. You know, I there was a guy. Was, I, I gave a reading at the Harvard Club, and um, I was teaching when I was 22 at Harvard. And this guy stood up and he said, "You were my teacher." Um, and you were 22, and I was 18. I thought, oh, Christ. You know, I, you know that poor guy, his poor parents playing this fortune intuition uh, to send the 18-year-old to be taught by a 22-year-old. So I, I said, look, I'm sorry right now. If you're looking for a public apology, you've got it. I, the, uh, it would be a very good idea to see if you could develop a series for cable or for Netflix or something because they just allow creativity. They, they uh, invite it. I whip them. No, I don't know what. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you take it. Uh, no, I mean, there's, there's great writing in every conceivable possible way. Boccaccio is not about suffering. Right. Uh, he's funny. Uh, Cicero, I'd rather grow old in the company of Cicero than, you know, with Dick Cheney, for Christ's <laughs> sake. That's you know. not fair. You'd rather grow old with anybody <laughs> with Dick Cheney. <laughs> Uh, and, but Cicero has a sense of humor and a sense of perspective about life and death and all the other big numbers that we go through in, in a course of a lifetime. How would they not know suffering? How do you, um, in uh, Kayak Morning, I came across a quotation which I put in there from Philo. Be kind, for everyone you meet is carrying a great burden. Just I mean, think of it. Everyone you meet, not most of the people you meet. So, um, I, forgive me, I didn't mean to come in uh, into what Pete was saying, but I don't know how it would be possible not to know suffering. Yeah, yeah, in, in terms of having a, a life that's a human life, um, full of disappointment, and, um, and yet, for most of us, uh, one that, uh, that has its share of triumphs, too. You know, that you, you don't have to win an Academy Award to feel like your life is of some value. Ways much more interesting and important things to do besides careers. Yeah, career is a very, very dangerous word, for, particularly for a yeah. writer. The worst, worse than career is legacy. Oh, Christ. You know, <laughs> uh, they ought to write that out. That's right. Get no. rid of legacy. The work. Just do the work. Yeah. <laughs> it's <laughs> Pete was talking about his dad with one leg, you know, working his whole life and never making a fuss about it. And we were talking be uh, before. Uh, this is the world that most of us here grew up in. I like that world. Um, the uh, um, not self-congratulatory. Um, it just goes about its business. It's hard yes. enough to just to go about its business. Well, particularly that generation that went through the Depression, World War II, and a lot of other stuff, and yet came out the other end. It's amazing how many people had 
great lives for one simple piece of legislation, the GI Bill of Rights, right. which changed the country. It created the modern middle class, one of those big government programs they all hate so much, <laughs> the, the League of Frightened White Guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that would be, that's look a great what it title. Gave us. Don't waste that title on us. <laughs> right. But look what it gave us. GI Bill. I can't resist this. Uh, um, uh, uh, tell this audience the what Patrick Kavanaugh told you when you saw an interview with him. This is I, it was I came to mind when he met uh, Seamus Heaney. Patrick Kavanaugh was a great um, Irish poet of the generation just before Seamus Heaney. So he didn't have what Heaney and Derek Mahan <laughs> and a whole lot of others had, which is the teaching fellowship at Harvard or the, the trip to Berkeley for two semesters or whatever. He didn't, none of that was available to him. He would go selling a newspaper, Kavanaugh's Weekly, bar to bar. So 1963, I'm in a bar in Dublin called McDade's. And in comes Patrick Keeney, Patrick uh, Kavanaugh. Jeez, I, I was with a friend. He said, I'll be right back. And I went over to Heaney, to the Kavanaugh, and said, Mr. Kavanaugh, my name is Hamill, blah, 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 blah. I'm a great admirer of your poetry. I'd love to sit and interview you. I was writing a column at the time from Book World, the Herald Tribune Sunday book thing. could spare the time, I'd love to do it. He looks down at me. Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> so I burst out laughing. <laughs> you know, and he turned and <laughs> had his grumpy little jar. <laughs> But every time I would see Heaney after that, he would ask me to tell the story again. <laughs> and I told, the first time I told it to him was down on the Liffey, there's a statue of, of Kavanaugh sitting on a bench beside the, the Liffey. And uh, that's when I told him the story the first time. That, that word used right is just the greatest thing for me. <laughs> <laughs> after the experience, I, th I told this story in Making Toast. Um, my wife, <laughs> Ginny, you have to know her to, in, in a sense to appreciate this. Um, uh, when we were first, mar <laughs> when first married, uh, or married a few years, our, our firstborn Carl was three years old, and we it was Easter, and we tell him the story of the Easter Bunny. Carl is a literalist, and he, he comes in at, uh, ten, say, 10 o'clock at night. We're still up. And he says, is the Easter Bunny here yet? And you can see the terror in his eyes, because it is a preposterous story. An egg-bearing mammal is walking through the house. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, we say, no, he's just not here yet. Um, go to sleep. <laughs> Two hours later, we're in bed. He comes in. Is the Easter Bunny here yet? No, Carl. He's going to come in. He's going to wait the eggs around, and then we'll look for the eggs in the morning. I should indicate that we are an entirely a religious family, and we cherry pick among the religions for the things that amuse us. So <laughs> we, we celebrate Easter, we celebrate Christmas, we, we'd celebrate anything that would have something funny in it, uh, or something fun or touching in it. So uh, comes in two o'clock in the morning. We are asleep now, and says, "Has Easter Bunny?" He, clearly, he hasn't slept. The poor child is just <laughs> overwrought with the idea of this <laughs> giant animal walking around the house. <laughs> and Ginny is the sweetest woman in the world. Her uh, 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 had no, 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 not never walked within miles of an embittered world, much less a bad one. And Carl comes in at four in the morning now, and before he can get the question, and Ginny sits straight up in bed and says, "There is no fucking Easter Bunny." <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, talk about great moments in sports. Yeah. <laughs> Has he ever ordered rabbit when he goes to a 
No, but the, the funny, you should see the relief in the little guy's face. He didn't care about the word. You know, he just, there's, there's no, oh, thank God, there's no Easter money. I can go to sleep now. Yes, <laughs> You think your language has not is not the same when you write an email because it's all business. Mm -hmm. Imagine the collected tweets of Henry James. <laughs> you know. <laughs> no, but I, it might be that there's a secret uh, current of literate emails that are going back and forth to people. You don't know. The only people who would know are the NSA guys, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> this is one with a verb. <laughs> <You know. laughs> but it's too bad, because I just got a book of the collected letters of Italo Calvino, who's a writer, Italian writer I love. It's always surprising and things. And to sit there and vanish into those letters with him talking to editors and back and forth is like a seminar of some kind. You know, you're sitting there learning something on every page. And, and the patience to write yeah. the letter. The letter itself was a, a, a work of art. A yeah. Genre. No, you're right. I mean, maybe it's just gone forever because of the, the machinery of our time. I, I mean, for me, I don't get past procrastination. I love procrastination. <laughs> um, but, uh, no, I, I brood a lot about the subject. I can write. So I'm, um, I have a lot of friends, uh, writers better than I, who are in pain from writing. I am mm. not one of those people. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And you, uh, we couldn't be. I mean, we worked for people who said, well, that's nice, you're paying, you're fired. So the, <laughs> the, 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 we had to uh, uh, produce quickly and, and develop uh, that skill. But I do like to spend a lot of time thinking about it. I don't think it's necessary. I mean, you seem worried about it. Be, you've produced a couple of books already. Um, there's nothing, there's no, it's not a science. It, it, it comes to you at different times, in different moods. Uh, there will be a time when you won't be able to stop, when the noise of your mind will wake you up in the middle of the night, insist you go down to the kitchen and start writing again. And, and then you'll know you're, you're on a roll, you're, uh, you're right. But um, I certainly wouldn't over-worry it. When, when Robert Kennedy got killed, and I was there that night, I was from here to there when he was shot, um, I couldn't write for weeks after that because it all seemed sort of useless to me. And I had been living in California during the primaries and all that. Came home, and I had um, lunch one day at the Second Avenue Deli with Paul O'Dwyer, a wonderful old Italian. And he says, well, what are you doing? Nothing, Paul. He says, what? What do you mean? I said, I have a kind of a writer's block, Paul. And he looks at me and says, 
For Christ's sakes, you're not important enough to have a writing. <laughs> 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 and I laughed, and the next day I started writing. And uh, started great. Writing. Wonderful story. One thing to do is to tell yourself you're double parked. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That'll get you working with a little urgency. To say. I think more, more than anything, it's Flaubert's advice to Maupassant was get black on white, which he meant get it on paper. So even if you feel like you only know half a sentence of what you want to write, if you start writing it, something happens with the hand. The, hum the hands have memory. memory. And you'll see the and words it, begin to flow. It's so true, and it had, they have a kind of magic. You don't really know what you think until you write. Yes. Yeah. You think you know what you think, and then you write a sentence and say, who, who wrote that? Do I mean yeah. that? I didn't know that. I didn't know that. <laughs> exactly. That's, I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the wonder of it. Oh, yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. Um, I'm, I didn't know Pete did, but uh, yeah, I, I certainly have it, the legal pad. And yeah, yellow le legal pad. And what I'll do is write two or three pages. Then I go to the computer. I then get a second draft of the two or three pages, and the momentum carries me right. for a couple more. <laughs> this is why he's so much more modern than I. I just started. I don't even use a computer. I use a, an iPad because it's closer to a typewriter, which I've used all these years. I cornered the market on cartridges for IBM Selectrics. <laughs> <laughs> and I will sell at a very high price to anyone here these cartridges because you can't find them except in my house. You got a, ty I, you got a typewriter ribbon you can spare? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was so scared that they would go out of existence that I would just buy and mass them like a crazy person, you know, to, uh, uh, to have these things. And then when the iPad came along and it was close enough, I can do that. But I had, don't have a computer. I couldn't possibly, <laughs> I wouldn't know what to do with a computer. The, um, the feeling of writing is something that we both enjoy. Yeah. The tactile feeling. Of also, I think writing longhand, th there's a kind of innocence to certain kinds of writing. And it almost always, was starting with just your hands, um, you're thrown back to, in some unconscious way, to what you were like before you learned how to type. You know, so that you go back to the instincts when you were 11 or 12 of trying to get things on paper somehow. So uh, I read a wonderful book 10 years ago, 15 years ago, called Ways of the Hand. And it was by a guy named Sudno, S-U-D-N-O-W. And he was a a classically trained musician who couldn't play jazz. And the book is a kind of an intellectual quest to try to find out why. And the conclusion he came to was that he didn't trust his hands, that the hands have yeah, yeah. memory. You can't play jazz uh, and turn the page <laughs> with right. the sheet music. You got to got to come like this. Uh, so, th and that was, that basically, that book articulated what I already knew, which often happens uh, with books. You know, you've, it comes from a different angle, discussing a different thing, music, but it's about the same <laughs> thing of, of uh, how do you, what's the best way to proceed? How do you, how do you do it? And it's true what you said. I never thought of it the, 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 the same thing. But when you're playing the piano, especially the way I do, because I'm just a, a piano bar player, you know, um, uh, what will happen is you'll make a mistake, and the mistake will turn out to be better than anything you got right. You hit the you hit a note that doesn't really belong in someone to watch over me. It just doesn't belong there. But you hit it twice and it suddenly belongs there. You hit it three times, yeah. you can build the entire arrangement around it. Um, I interviewed Dizzy Gillespie one time, and he said a variation on that. 
I asked him, what, what advice do you give to young musicians? He says, if you make a mistake, do it twice. They'll think you meant it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Which is a variation of musicians, the same thing. Musicians are very, very funny. Yeah, uh, they are. He was mentioning Gene Cooper. The other great drummer of that time was Buddy Rich. And Buddy Rich was just a mean bastard. And the... Uh, um, they said that but Buddy Rich's last words, they swear this is true, was, I still hate country. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite editing story is, a, is about musicians, which is uh, when John Coltrane started doing the long solos, playing with Miles Davis in the, in the group, in the quintet. And so one night he gets into one of the solos and he's going and going. Miles is looking at his watch. <laughs> and he's, Coltrane's playing. Miles goes in, has a cigarette on the side of the stage, comes back. He's still in the solo. And at the end of the, the, end of the set, finally, Miles goes to him and said, John, you got to do something about them solos. <laughs> he says, yeah, Miles, but I can't help it. He said, I get, I get into the music, and I, I don't know how to get out of it. <laughs> and Miles says, take your mouth away from the fucking house. <laughs> 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 My favorite editing. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, sir. Well, um, Pete, I mean, you've got to read downtown, Pete's um, uh, hymn to the city. Um, and you'll get an awful lot there. That's what we talked about before, the sense of the loss of something that matters. Um, I always, E.B. White, his essay is very well known, but I always thought he had it wrong. That not, I mean, not not wrong because he couldn't be all wrong. But he was said he said that uh, what he found in New York that he loved most was privacy and loneliness. Well, frankly, you'll find privacy and loneliness in any city, yeah. um, and uh, that never interested me. I, and I, the reason I thought that it, it was made a lot of is that a lot of out of out of towners come to live in New York. He was an out of towner who came to live in. York, it is natural that you'd be aware of loneliness and privacy compared to a small town where you probably didn't have either. But for me, it was, it's, it's the magic of the city, which I still feel. I wrote this book after I taught a class on 27th Street, realized I was in the neighborhood of my childhood, and then started to write the book. There wasn't, a m and I, I, uh, the book pretends that it's a single night. It's obviously a lot of nights that I compressed into one. But the I have never lost the feeling of sheer wonder at the beauty and magic of the city. The, uh, there was a, um, and the, the idea that it's not really happening, it's the dreamlike quality of the place. Maybe it's a way of saving oneself from the hard life of a city that is, of course, really happening. But still, there is this, this wonder to it, the street scene. There was a great movie in 1930 called Street Scene. Uh, where people are suffering on the steps of a tenement, and yet you, you hesitate to say so, but the, there was the beauty of poverty and the beauty of suffering. Um, uh, beauty intrudes and in, just insists on itself in the most difficult circumstances. I remember seeing this small woman whom, of whom I write, just noticing her, um, standing at the top of the st of, uh, uh, steps of a brownstone on 18th Street, looking to her right towards 3rd Avenue and not moving for a few minutes in a pea jacket that was a few sizes too big, a gamine. And I thought she could be waiting for a train someplace, just looking for mm. the train. And that train could be here or it could be in Russia or it could be in Alabama. Um, it was just, she was a, um, uh, a dream. Uh, I'm not even sure she was there, but the if I dreamt her, she dreamt me, and that quality of uh, uh, the quality of the unreal in the city is the thing that I love most about it. I I agree with all of that, and <coughs> also 
the other the other part of what I love about the city is structural is that we're an alloy, not a single metal, and that all the metals combined into this alloy um, give us the the city we have um, and part of the alloy comes from every immigrant group every immigrant group group brings two things in the baggage that hands is handed over to all the rest of us music and food um, the Irish you don't want to have the food <laughs> you know because their model was the Brits who thought food was fuel you know no pleasure allowed <laughs> but thank God the Sicilians and the Jews came along and <laughs> taught us how to eat um, but that sense of the alloy that it's uh, for example the kids that come to NYU and some of the classes I teach I always try to get them to go to the Tenement Museum down off Orchard Street wonderful it's f it, first of all it's got one of the best bookstores about New York in the city, but also to be able to look at the way those apartments were laid out, at the sense of constricted space. Um, and everything went on in that space. Yeah. People died, people were yeah. born in the, in, the, in the smallest space. You can imagine what that did to the imagination of yeah. a child. And everybody who lived in them, you know, whether they were Irish, Italian, Jewish, they all won the late rounds. They won it. Uh, it was worth it. It gave them the credentials to do anything they want in this town. Pete talks about uh, you, you, you can the the city almost in an imaginative mind creates its own metaphors. Pete talks about Broadway in one of the books. It, it's either forever or in uh, downtown as the. The reason, oh, it must be downtown because you're talking about Broadway downtown as the yeah. trunk of the tree, which then moves into branches. I mean, it takes it's the imaginative uh, artist who then sees from above this avenue that becomes this tree that he chooses to see implanted in the city. That's what I mean by dreams. Here's, here's um, uh, what I wrote about the Empire State Building. It, it, it's a detective moving around the city. Uh, the, it's it's the, my, my uh, way of moving through the book. No mystery to the Empire State, except that tall as it is, the building never surprises you. Perhaps because it's old and familiar, the city's favorite uncle who just plants himself in the middle of the house. Standing on 34th Street, I look up to it, as ever. Its feeling of calm comfort is what appealed to King Kong. I am sure of it. Not the height, though he might have experienced a wave of fellow feeling with the tallest thing around for miles. He might have thought, this building knows how difficult how demanding, how embarrassing it is to be the gorilla in the room. In that case, it could be assumed that King Kong did not so much scale the Empire State as embrace it. So that might have been his reason. But I think it was something else. I mean, here was this big ape, and here was this big uncle of New York City, the old man who implied merely by being, you are safe with me, King Kong. And even if it turns out that you aren't safe, even if you clamor to the top of me, your massive hairy hand enclosing Fay Ray, with one last chance at love within your grasp, and a swarm of biplanes swoop down out of nowhere and ack ack at you, and you holding onto my rooftop bike where the blimp's tied up, and you begin to lose your grip, even <coughs> then, it will be all right. You have lived long enough, King Kong. A good life, a big life, the biggest. If you must fall, fall from me. Uh. Well, <laughs> we're, we're, we're natural friends, but we're kids from the streets. Yeah. <laughs> How do you First of it? all, before everything else, read journalism. Read the great practitioners going back the last 75 years. Um, read the, 
with papers that are s and magazines that are still publishing on a high level. Um, be wary of blogs. A lot of them are interesting as therapy, but not as journalism. Uh, you might feel better getting off about somebody you can't stand, but th that's not the same as getting out of the house and going up to the third floor right and knocking on the door and finding out what happened. Be, let your curiosity drive you, and that curiosity should extend to the great masters of the craft of, of the past, too. Every one of us can learn from the people that came before us. The beauty of being a writer is that you feel the company of the writers who came before yes. you. Very nice. Also pay attention to language. The writers that you love, that you love right now, are the ones who um, understood Mark Twain's dictum that the difference between the word and the right word is the difference between the lightning bug and the lightning. Uh, You're only in the lightning business. Um, take your time with choosing that word. Uh, you'll find in the journalists that you love, certainly in the things that Pete wrote when he was uh, writing about New York, and the things that made it stand out was the language that he wanted you to, your head to snap back and say, oh, that's the word. That's the word that, um, that makes me understand this more. It isn't, the, uh, uh, journalism isn't simply a count of what's happening. It's what's happening through you back to the page. And even when it doesn't work, which can happen, keep in mind the great piece of advice from Samuel Beckett. Fail better. <laughs> <laughs> Fail better. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you.